Welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Carolyn Patton, Alberta Chair for the Canadian Forces Liaison Council. And on behalf of our council, we thank you for making the time to attend our webinar. Business leaders, reservists, military members, friends and colleagues, please welcome our speakers, Colonel Mike Vernon, Commander of 41 Canadian Brigade Group, and Julie, Major Julie Hautfati, Officer Commanding 14 Service Company, 41 Service Battalion. First, let us begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the traditional and ancestral territories of the people of Treaty 6, 7, and 8, as well as the unceded territory of the Métis people where our activities take place here today. We recognize and respect the cultural heritage, histories, languages, worldviews, and relationship to the land of the many Indigenous peoples who have lived on, cared for, and gathered in this beautiful province for countless generations. Now, a few logistics. I know that this is what you've all been waiting for. Uh, we welcome you to chat with each other in the chat box, and you'll see that along the bottom in your uh, Zoom interface. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask our speakers, uh, please post them to the Q&A box and submit your questions throughout. We'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end of both speakers. And we would be remiss if we did not mention our communication supporters, Edmonton Chamber of Commerce and Todayville Media, along with Red Deer Chamber of Commerce, Lethbridge Chamber, Economic Development Lethbridge. As hosts for speaker series, we thought we would provide you with some short and sweet and quick information about CFLC. We are a volunteer organization with more than 140 Canada-wide business executives and educational leaders, and we highlight the benefits of the reserve force training and the talent that reservists bring to the workplace. Uh, we like to say that hundreds of thousands of dollars are invested into each and every reservist with training and education that sets them up for success and apart from other employee candidates, providing employers with an employee who already understands what it takes to succeed. I like to say that when you employ a reservist, you too are serving your country. And with that, you'll hear some of, hear some and see some of that training today uh, in a behind the scenes look at Alberta's Army Reservists. Uh, just a quick overview, our CFLC organization also offers it with Glowing Hearts Initiative for employers, an important pilot program. And for the reservists on the webinar, please feel free to share with your employer. We know that reservists bring exceptional qualifications to any organization and with many re employed from C-suite to small business. It's a program that highlights a business or organization as reserve friendly. And the reserves is one of the largest talent pools in Canada. I mean, think about that. That's approximately 28 to 30,000 reservists, give or take. And the With Glowing Hearts Initiative provides tools and for employers to support reservists and attract them as new employees. It also helps augment an HR program to include reservists. And the program includes a toolkit with a Reservist 101 booklet. It demystifies who reservists are and what they do, a certificate, military leave policy information and template, and yes, stickers, because we all love stickers. <laughs> and an online icon for the organization uh, to share on their website or social media. And it's all customized with the business name. And you can see in this uh, example, it shows ACCO, who is also signed on for the program. The certificate you receive will be signed by our national chair, Scott Shepard, and the chief of reserves and employer support, Brigadier General Rob Roy McKenzie. And you can register for the, uh, you can register your company or find out more information at cflcwithglowinghearts.ca. With that, I would like to introduce Colonel Mike Vernon. Colonel Vernon is the commander of 41 Canadian Brigade Group here in Alberta. He joined the regular force in 1981 after graduating from the Royal Military College and completed a Master's of Arts degree in English Literature at Dalhousie University. When he was commissioned in Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and on his military journey, he joined the Canadian Highlanders in 1999. He was promoted in 2019 to his present rank and role as commander of the 41 Brigade. Colonel Vernon is also a reservist and balancing a civilian career teaching journalism at Mount Royal University in Calgary. 
Yes, he is a natural storyteller. And you may remember Colonel Vernon when he was a CBC journalist and a TV news producer. He also created two documentaries highlighting personal experiences of soldiers who served in Afghanistan. And if you have a moment to view those, I really encourage you to do so. There's quite an emotional journey into um, soldiers who served. Thank you, Mike, for speaking with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks very much, Carolyn. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, I know the audience is a real mixed bag, having seen the participant list. So we've got some people who know an awful lot about the Army Reserve and potentially some who know nothing about it. So I've tried to pitch my presentation down the middle. Um, and this is what we'll look at today. So starting with some fundamentals, I've, I've got a bit of a video to show you and uh, to set the scene, but then I'm gonna talk about sort of who we are, what we do, and then I'll touch on some of the challenges that we're facing, some of which you're no doubt aware of if you, uh, if you read the newspapers and, and social media. And we'll finish by looking at, you know, what are the benefits, the individual benefits to somebody who, uh, who ex explores, you know, a path along, uh, this route with the Army Reserve. Next. So here's the video. People in green are Canadians, people in gray are American National Guard, and the civilians are actually Spanish speaking role players who are contracted for the exercise. We'll show you about two minutes of this. get a feel for ourselves exactly how the civilian population is, what kind of condition they're in, and uh, what their needs are. Hey, hey! Hey! Okay, so that's just a little taste of uh, an exercise we did back in 2015 in Wainwright. I, I guess I should highlight for those who are new to the Army Reserve that all the ammunition was blank and all those wounds were simulated by makeup artists. So um, so who are we? Well, now the title of this is the Army Reservists Among Us because we could be anybody. Uh, we could be uh, first responders. We have lawyers who are sergeants and officers. Uh, many students, either high school, post-secondary, they're teachers, oil patch workers, uh, farmers, uh, executives, people with the provincial government, uh, tradespeople. Um, and you can join when you're as young as 16 and you can serve until you're 59 in the uh, Army Reserve. Uh, but you can't go overseas until you're a little bit older, uh, 18. Currently, we have just over 1,700 members in, in uh, 41 Canadian Brigade Group. We've had about a 4% uh, attrition rate uh, due to COVID or over the course of COVID. So we've lost about 75 people since uh, March 2020. We have a headquarters in Calgary and nine units around the province. So we have people in the, you know, the all of Alberta's uh, sort of major cities in the south, uh, as well as Yellowknife. And we have a small uh, company up there. And these are the sort of trades that you could expect uh, to do if you were to join 41 uh, Brigade. You know, infantry, armored reconnaissance, artillery. Um, there are other reservists in Alberta who are not part of the Brigade, uh, strictly speaking, although they have a, a relationship to it. And that is, uh, there are medical reservists, military police, and intelligence as well. 
And in Calgary and Edmonton, we have the Navy, the Naval Reserve uh, in uh, HMCS Tecumseh here in Calgary and non such up in Edmonton. So our courses are about 90% the same, and I've just kind of picked that number out of the air, to be honest, uh, as the regular force. So what that means is we have, you know, largely the same training, which also means that if someone wants to join the Army Reserve, take it for a, a test drive, and then it's very possible for them to, to uh, develop a full-time career within the regular force if they want to transfer across. Similarly, um, and this is a message we really need to get out uh, in, in a better way, uh, people who finished a regular force career are more than welcome to come across and become part-time soldiers uh, with us. Our initial training, depending on uh, one's classification, can be quite uh, demanding time-wise. So a lot of it is pitched at uh, attracting students because, for example, if you want to be an infantry officer, well, you have to spend two full summers uh, doing your training for that. You know, and how many people who are 40 years old with uh, a spouse and two children uh, can get that kind of time off from their civilian employer? It's very difficult to negotiate. Um, so that's why we look, you know, amongst uh, university students in particular uh, to become junior officers and things like that. Once you're in, you know, the, the obligation is or the expectation is that you'll parade once a week. Uh, Wednesday night, Tuesday or Thursday night at a local armory and, and put in one or two weekends a month uh, to maintain the, your, your core skills from your, your training courses, uh, to conduct additional courses, uh, perhaps to do some ceremonial and social events. And often our weekend exercises could be conducted locally, you know, in uh, uh, you know, the foothills, for example, outside Calgary. Or if it involves any kind of live fire, especially, it'll have to be somewhere like Wainwright or Suffield. So in general, the, the sort of the yardstick we use is this expectation of 37 and a half training days per year. Some people put in much more time, some people put in less time. Um, if you're going on a course, a uh, deployment, obviously you'll be put on a contract for the duration of that. So we have some people who, uh, who are, although the reservists and they get to live where they want to live, i.e. let's say in Calgary, they may have done three, four, uh, three-year contracts working, for example, in my headquarters as a staff officer. So um, because they're reservists, they don't get posted like you would in a regular force. They get to you know, live in their home city for as long as they want, um, uh, but they, they could take a job somewhere else, but that's totally up to them. And uh, I think an important thing to note is that there's no obligatory service for the Army Reserve. So if you join today and you could put in 20 years or you could put in, uh, you know, you really you could put in a, a couple of weeks or months and decide if it's not for you and then you can you can take your release. So our fundamentally, our job is to augment the regular force as needed, either as individuals or as uh, potentially as a section or, uh, you know, a 30 to 40 member troop or platoon. Um, during the First and Second World Wars, this meant general mobilization of the militia, as it was known at the time. But today, it's all based on volunteerism. So, for example, uh, I went to Sierra Leone for nine months. It was totally my decision to apply for that uh, position. And I made it work with my civilian employer. And, uh, you know, it was, it was all voluntary. This is very different from what we see in the movies when it comes to the American. Uh, Army Reserve or uh, the U.S. National Guard. So, for example, when we sent soldiers reservists to Afghanistan, every single one of them volunteered for a specific job at a specific time. Um, in the U.S. system, entire units get mobilized. So, you know, an entire infantry battalion in, in Washington state uh, that we know of and we have some uh, ties with was mobilized twice to go to Iraq. Everybody in that unit was expected to deploy. Domestically, uh, it's not all about uh, going overseas. So domestically, uh, reservists have stepped up uh, time and again when there's a need, for example, fighting floods and wildfires. So the wildfires in BC in 2003 that you know were burning outside Kelowna, Okanagan Falls, and um, Penticton, uh, hundreds of reservists volunteered for that. The Calgary floods, we, uh, we had 500 volunteers come to Calgary within about 24 hours 
uh, to volunteer the first weekend of those floods. Um, for the uh, pandemic, last year we had about 450 people volunteer to be on standby if they were needed. And similarly, uh, 90 volunteers this spring in case they were required for vaccine distribution. These are just some photos of the flood that we, those of us in Calgary remember, uh, soldiers sandbagging in Inglewood. And the uh, picture at the right is Operation Peregrine, the uh, BC wildfires in 2003. Overseas, so at the height of, you know, the UN involvement in the former Yugoslavia, uh, in Afghanistan in sort of 2006 to 2011, about 20% of Canadian battle groups were uh, comprised of reservists. Um, a significant number, you know, I mean, these, these battle groups would have been seriously under strength if reservists hadn't stepped up and volunteered uh, to go overseas. Um, we've just finished doing the research and uh, we estimate that um, members of our brigade uh, completed approximately 500 individual tours in Afghanistan. The Calgary Highlanders, uh, deployed more reservists to Afghanistan than any other Canadian reserve unit. And they were followed closely by the Loyal Edmonton Regiment uh, in second place for that distinction. And that resulted in the, uh, the honor that you see in the upper right, the uh, Chief of Defence Staff Commendation for the Calgary Highlanders for this level of volunteerism. But that came at a cost, uh, a very serious cost. Uh, seven Alberta reservists died in Afghanistan and several more were seriously wounded. These are the, uh, the seven soldiers uh, who died, three of them from the Loyal Edmonton Regiment. Um, we've just, as I said, finished the research to identify who served, and we're in the process of uh, creating a commemorative mural in my headquarters that will honor the service of everyone, and in particular, these seven soldiers. So what are some of our current challenges? Um, the biggest one, that we're all aware of is uh, inappropriate conduct and uh, just the uh, the blows that are coming through uh, media revelations almost a, on a weekly basis about the senior leadership. So there are um, uh, significant efforts underway from from the top, but also from the grassroots level, I would say, uh, you know, from, uh, in, for example, uh, seven female members of my headquarters uh, submitted a, a lengthy briefing note on recommendations uh, with respect to what we could be doing better going forward. Um, the integration uh, administratively and equipment wise between the uh, regular force and the reserve continues to be an issue. It's not on the slide, but uh, um, and that's being discussed right now as part of a process to uh, to modernize the Canadian Army um, through initiatives like Force 2025. And then COVID has obviously limited some of our in-person training. You know, we've become much more adept at using platforms like this, uh, or MS Teams in particular. Uh, we have a significant recruiting backlog. We opened the TAPS a couple of years ago through the Strengthening the Army Reserve Initiative. And we currently have more than 1,200 open files, but uh, uh, a limited capacity to process those until the, you know, the province opens up more fully. And that's resulted in some training delays as well, once we actually get people enrolled. So I think we're all looking forward to the day when COVID uh, is no longer a thing, and that will certainly help us in addressing the, uh, the last three points there. Uh, and just to finish on a, on a positive note, these are some of the benefits, I think some of the reasons why people are attracted to the Army Reserve. And uh, certainly this ethos of service that uh, Carolyn touched on at the beginning is, is significant. Um, you know, you're paid for your time, your training, you get significant uh, leadership experience and, and comradeship. I, I suspect people make some of the best friends of their life um, within the military culture. Opportunities to travel uh, for students, there's guaranteed full-time summer employment for the first four years. There's uh, money for tuition reimbursement, dental, pension, and when you get out and when you finish your military service, either as a regular force soldier or as a reservist, uh, you can qualify for up to $80,000 uh, in educational benefits through Veterans Affairs. This is relatively new, um, that it's you know $10,000 a semester. So it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, that's my presentation. I'll, I'll take questions later on. Uh, back to you, Carolyn. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh 
greatly appreciate you sharing your insights and dedication. And certainly thank you for your leadership in Alberta and, and all of Canada. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, we'll move on to Julie. Uh, Major Julie Helferty is also a reservist and a company commander in 41 Service Battalion. As with many reservists, she is also has a full-time career. Not too sure how she balances both. Uh, she is a police officer with the city of Calgary, and she manages to balance her military commitments with her civilian role and has an incredibly supportive employer with, this, with the Calgary Police Service. Major Helferty has deployed twice overseas, both to Afghanistan and a recent deployment to Lebanon. Uh, oh, did I mention Major Helferty was also a junior high teacher before she became a police officer? I would say that's enough training ground for any career, Julie. Welcome and thank you for being here today and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks to the CFLC for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I joined the Army Reserves in 2008 as a logistics officer. So some of these photos here are from the first few years when I was in the reserves. Uh, normally, I'm a part-time soldier. Uh, so I basically work one night a week or one to two weekends a month, um, with the exception of some full-time courses that I've done for uh, usually weeks at a time um, on various bases through Canada, some in Calgary as well. But uh, I've been to CFP Edmonton, to Gagetown, Borden and Kingston, uh, for, uh, for various uh, training that I've done, but for the majority of uh, the past 13 years, I've been a part-time soldier working with uh, 41 Service Battalion. Some of the positions that I've held in my unit with 41 Service Battalion uh, are platoon commander for three years. I've been a recruiting officer uh, and also a uh, second in command for, my, for the company that I currently command, uh, 14 Service Company, which I took over command of in September of 2020. The next slide, please. Over the past 13 years, I was privileged to deploy twice overseas. The first time was in July of 2013. I was deployed to Beggar Airfield in Afghanistan as part of Operation Attention. Uh, I'm gonna throw some acronyms at you, uh, but I'll try to just spell them out so that you kind of uh, are tracking, because I know we have a tendency to do that in the military. Um, I worked as part of the logistics development branch of the Afghan National Security Force Development Directorate uh, in Regional Command East. So I worked as part of the Combined Joint Task Force 101. I was actually attached uh, to them and I worked as part of uh, the 101st Airborne uh, actually with the United States. As you can see, there's a couple of T-walls there with the Screaming Eagle Airborne uh, on it, and that's actually the patch that I wore on my shoulder while I was deployed, which was re really cool. My direct boss was a U.S. Lieutenant Colonel uh, when I deployed. Um, our job was to liaise with the advisors working directly with the Afghans. Uh, I worked uh, with them to generate uh, reports on various logistics matters. Uh, they were working with the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police through Regional Command East. And, uh, and so our job was to uh, advise our commanders of the progress uh, for what the advisors were doing collectively, and also to assist with directing the advisor efforts uh, further. Next slide. Most recently, I, uh, in October of 2019, I deployed to Beirut, Lebanon. I was part of ROTO Zero, uh, which is the first group going in for any particular mission of the two-year logistics enhancement team. This was part of Canadian Training Assistance Team Lebanon, or I'll call that CTAT-L from now on. Uh, and CTAT-L was established to, to promote regional stability in the Middle East as part of Operation Impact. Uh, CTAT-L uh, does what we call capacity building activities. So they bring in teams of soldiers to work with the Lebanese soldiers uh, to improve uh, specific uh, capacities. So in our case, this was the logistics enhancement team for a two year period. There were eight members on my team uh, and we were divided into three sub teams, the doctrine development team, the material management team and the training development team. So my job was to be the training development team lead and uh, three of us were on the training development team. I worked with a master warrant officer, weapons tech and, uh, and also a training development officer. We worked as a team alongside the Lebanese Armed Forces Technical School at their Logistics Brigade. 
we worked with them to develop a school development plan so that they could actually uh, take on the responsibility of providing more courses for their technicians working in the workshops and also to mentor them through a deliberate job analysis and a curriculum design process that, uh, that the uh, training development officers are experts in. I would say our biggest accomplishment on this deployment uh, was completing the majority of the curriculum for what we called a workshop foundations course. And for any of the military folks on here, it's, uh, it's basically the, the Rini Common type equivalent, um, which is the introductory course for technicians. Uh, and actually a trial of this course was conducted in the subsequent uh, rotation that took over from us on this team. Next slide. So let me, uh, I'm a teacher, so I actually brought props. Uh, let me take off my beret for a second and put on my other hat, which is my forage cap. Uh, my full-time career is actually uh, with the Calgary Police Service. Um, so this is where I receive the majority of my income, my pensions with them. Um, this is my primary occupation. And I've been with the Calgary Police Service uh, since, uh, oh, just go back one slide, please. Um, since 2010. Uh, this has been an absolutely amazing and fulfilling career for me. I've had so many opportunities. I've been uh, able to coach uh, new officers that have uh, just finished their recruit classes and come out on the street for the first few weeks on the job. Uh, I've been trained in incident command, uh, which means I can, uh, I can basically uh, be an acting sergeant to run a district operationally managing anything that comes in during the time that I'm uh, in that role. Um, and then over three summers with the Calgary Police, I, uh, I actually was on the mountain bike team. And one of those, I was actually running the team uh, in District 6, which was uh, so much fun. Uh, currently, I work as a patrol officer in District 6. Uh, so I work shift work. Um, and uh, next slide. So you might wonder, uh, how is it possible to have balanced both of these careers simultaneously? And I will say it's only because the Calgary Police Service supports reservists like me. And I like to break this, uh, this support into two categories, uh, the official support and the unofficial support. Uh, so the official support is through the Armed Forces Leave Policy, which is absolutely amazing. And I've taken advantage of it on numerous occasions. Um, I'm not going to get into any of those specific bullet points under, uh, under that, but essentially uh, the message is um, there has been no negative impact to my career with the police uh, as a result of any of my participation uh, in the reserves, um, which is really all I can ask for of an employer. Um, but then on top of that, the Calgary Police uh, provides so much unofficial support, and I like to call that the culture of support for reservists. And I think this is what's really touched me over the years. I can't even describe the level of support that I've received at all levels uh, during both of my deployments um, from coworkers, from all levels of management, uh, from other police officers who I didn't even know who found out I was deploying and reached out uh, to support me. Um, I'm going to actually kind of focus in on one of these, the bullet points there under culture of support and that's support, support for deployment extension due to COVID-19. Uh, so this is just uh, one example of uh, how the Calgary Police Service really supported me. My deployment uh, in Beirut was supposed to end in April of 2020, uh, but we all know what happened in March. Uh, and this pandemic hit globally. It uh, wasn't just a local thing, um, and that included Lebanon uh, and when I was deployed. The impact on us, well, there was a lot of impacts on us, but the, I would say the biggest impact on us was that our replacements couldn't come in on time. Um, so we sort of had two options as this was supposed to be a continuous two-year mission. One was to actually shut down the mission and then restart it whenever they would, uh, when they were able to bring in our next rotation. The second option was to have a couple of us extend our deployment in order to uh, allow for a proper handover. And this was the preferred option. Um, so what I did was I reached back to CPS and I asked for a leave extension. Um, and what I found was incredible amount of support. Um, HR not only generated a detailed memo explaining my circumstances, um, but staffed the paperwork for me. And then the Calgary Police Service ultimately supported uh, my extension, which is no small thing because as we all know, COVID was something that uh, not just the military was struggling with, but the CPS was struggling with as well. And there were so many unknowns. 
so uh, what was the, the result of this extension? Um, our mission uh, was continued. It allowed for a proper handover and it ensured the success of our Roto-1 rotation uh, coming in to replace us for the logistics enhancement team. So that's just one example of how the Calgary Police Service has gone above and beyond to support reservists. Uh, next slide. So you might ask then, how, what does the Calgary Police Service get out of this uh, deal of supporting me? So uh, I would suggest that uh, reserve training and experience uh, both directly and indirectly makes me a better police officer. Um, so these lists I generated are uh, not extensive in terms of training and experience. Um, for example, I, I see blatantly, I, I missed teamwork, for example, uh, which is huge in both organizations. Um, but I'm just gonna focus in on leadership uh, as an example. So the military from the beginning uh, provides formal training on leadership. So we learn the principles of leadership um, it's, a, it's something that we have to basically memorize and understand from the beginning. And then we're immediately thrown into leadership roles. So for example, I was a platoon commander right out of my basic training. Um, I also led the, the team in Lebanon and currently I have about 70 subordinates as a company commander. So how does this translate into the Calgary police service world? Well, it turns out that principles of leadership are the same in any organization, they don't change. Um, and in the Calgary Police Service, I've been placed in various leadership roles over the years. Um, even in patrol, where I currently work, uh, I'm a sen senior member, and I often have to take the leadership role uh, on calls. I also led a small team of uh, the mountain bike unit uh, over, at that, over the summer before I went to Lebanon. And occasionally, I operationally command a district as an acting sergeant, where we have about you know, 20 or 30 members working. Um, so these skills that I've acquired in the military have been directly applied in these roles with the Calgary Police. And that's just one example of, uh, of something that a reservist brings uh, to a job. I want to jump just to that bottom bullet point of the heart and mindset and the idea of service. So the military uses the term unlimited liability, which basically means a soldier can be required to put themselves in harm's way in service to their country, including risking their life. This mindset is common to all soldiers and is part of what the uniform represents. And it's shared by police officers in service to their community. The idea that you place the safety or the security of a citizen above yourself. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone in either uniform who hasn't deliberately considered the cost of this ethic in the most extreme and this is the mindset that we bring to our every, everyday work. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to you, Carolyn, and thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you, Julie, that was, uh, that was incredible. And I, I think what you touched on is, you know, what you bring from the military, you bring to the Calgary Police Service, but it's also a flip side too, because what you have in the Calgary Police Service, you also bring to the military. So there is kind of a win-win a situation there. And, uh, so thank you for your commitment to community and country and thank you for your service. And that's no small task. Michael, I'll bring you back on. I think we have uh, a few questions here. Uh, if you'd like to take some, that'd be great. We have a few in the slate. Sure. Okay. Uh, floods and fires are a hot topic, sorry for the pun, <laughs> in Alberta. And uh, you know, there's another season coming up. Uh, what are reservists doing to specifically prepare to assist in the uh, event that that may happen? And even a tornado, there could be another natural disaster that we we don't know. So how, would, sure. how what are reservists doing there? Yeah, so I get, the first thing I would emphasize is that we, we don't act alone. And we are with the regular force, like the force of last resort when, when things go bad like that. So... Uh, the lead is always taken by civilian agencies, you know, Alberta Emergency Management, for example. And, but should there be a request for assistance, we're ready to step up and, and we really um, provide uh, sort of a general labor capability with the leadership required for those soldiers. So, for example, when it comes to wildfires, you know, we're not at the we're not at the leading edge of, of fighting uh you know, a fire that's out of control somewhere or trying to bring it under control, we would 
uh, usually go in and deal with hot spots afterwards, sort of the mopping up, for example, or we might uh, assist with the, uh, you know, the evacuation of a community that's threatened by fire or flood, you know, using our, our vehicles and drivers and, you know, people from, uh, from Julie's unit in particular um, to prepare for that. Every year we go through a series of uh, planning exercises that involve liaising with local authorities. So this year, uh, the scenario was a potential wildfire around Canmore. And so uh, our planners got involved with, uh, you know, the uh, civilian planners uh, working in that area, uh, provincially and locally, uh, and brought them together with our people as well uh, here in Calgary and, and went through a, a command post exercise about, you know, how to respond. And, uh, and our soldiers are, are organized uh, um, to, to be able to provide a good domestic response companies from, you know, the north and the south and, and other elements. Um, the, bottom, the bottom line at the end of the day, though, is if there's a need, and I keep going back to these, you know, horrendous wildfires in 2003, if there's a need, then a call will go out for volunteers and we'll invite, you know, and we'll take in and process whoever comes forward within our brigade uh, to volunteer for a specific event. So we're not, you know, sitting on our rucksacks on standby, but if the call goes out and there's a, there's a, you know, a significant need like that, uh, we've always had people volunteer uh, in droves to be part of that, whether it's floods or wildfires. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. I know that there was a real sense of pride when uh, reservists uh, showed up for the floods to support Southern Alberta. That was really it was significant, that's for sure. Um, I guess this one is for both of you. What is the biggest challenge uh, for reservists at the brigade level and also at a personal level these days? Do you want to go first, Julie, this time? Sure. Uh, so I would say the biggest challenge is just uh, is actually balancing everything. Um, the thing about the reserves is there's uh, you can kind of put an unlimited amount of energy into it and it will exponentially make things better for the soldiers that are under your command um, and so it's sort of just uh, at times it's challenging to draw a line uh, as to you know maintaining some personal space and time um, while also being a good leader and doing my job effectively um, with the reserves uh, so yeah I'd say that's my biggest challenge. Yeah, and I would agree that that's a perennial challenge. You can get sucked into doing so much. You know, some people are so committed um, and that never changes, I think. Right. Uh, um, but I think uh, perhaps currently, uh, you know, day to day, I think COVID remains probably the, the, the biggest frustration on top of that. Right. We've had to cancel training. We've had to go online for a lot of training this past year. And, and frankly, that's not why people join the reserve. They, you know, they like that face to face, right? They, you know, a lot of them have a sense of adventure. They want to get out and, and go somewhere and do something. And there's really, there's only so much you can do online. Um, so in terms of the, let's say the individual frustrations, we'll all be ecstatic when we can, uh, when we can return to training like it used to be. And I would make the point that, you know, we have been training and, and we've been doing it safely, you know, observing all the proper protocols, you know, like this, that, um, uh, command post exercise I mentioned back in uh, in March here in Calgary, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, all those things we've been taught to do, you know, they all work. I mean, we could, if we had to, you know, do that for real in a COVID environment, no problem, you know, so we know that it's just not as much fun as, you know, what we normally would do, right? And, and as I touched on earlier, you know, the other, there are other significant things in process, you know, like dealing with inappropriate conduct, like, um, you know, reorienting our relationship with the regular force and the various uh, studies and, and, uh, and it's a planning that are, you know, underway there in terms of force development. Those are kind of happening. I think for the average soldier, those are kind of happening in the background. They may not be tracking, you know, the, the minutia around that just yet, but they will be impacted uh, definitely. Um, certainly by, uh, you know, issues around uh, inappropriate conduct. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have another one here. Uh, this question is either for Colonel Vernon or the Major. What do you think a reservist needs or values the most in terms of support from their employer? And since you're both an employee of an organization, from your perspective. 
why don't we ping pong and you can go first again, Julie. Um, well, I mean, like I mentioned, what touched me the most is, is the type of unofficial support uh, that, uh, I mean, whenever I return from my deployment, um, as everyone knows, reintegration uh, is, is pretty key. And, uh, and they understood that. They, they didn't, I mean, subject to needs of the service, HR could have placed me anywhere in the Calgary Police Service. Um, but they brought me back to the same district, back to the same team, so that I was with people that I was familiar with working with to support my reintegration. Uh, so it's just, um, I think it's a matter of communicating with the reservists specifically and asking what do they need. Um, and then uh, I guess another really big thing uh, for me was how CPS maintained contact with me. So they actually had someone in HR that specifically dealt with people on leave uh, for uh, like armed forces leave specifically. And that person reached out to me and gave me regular updates as to things going on with the Calgary Police so that I wasn't out of touch and I didn't feel disconnected from the organization when I was away on my training or my deployments. Um, so that was really helpful as well. And then uh, obviously the most important thing is just that that policy was in place, that there is an armed forces leave policy in place that I could uh, use to take advantage of um, so that I, I don't extend uh, my time at the Calgary Police uh, by being a reservist. I still you know, I do the same number of years I was supposed to. If I was going to make less money with the reserves, uh, then I would I would have with the Calgary Police and they provide top up pay. Um, and then like everything continues to accrue. My uh, seniority accrues everything. So there's no negative impact. And I think that's the important thing is that it's not I'm not going to be penalized uh, to participate in anything with the reserves. Um, and then on top of that, the Calgary Police is just incredibly supportive as well. Yeah, I, I think you could say that we've been very fortunate here in Alberta, uh, across the board, across the province, you know, uh, during Afghanistan, uh, those years in particular, right, that civilian employers were very accommodating for, for those soldiers who, who wanted to go overseas. Um, I remember, though, the first time I asked for military leave when I worked at CBC, you know, I requested military leave to go on, a, I think, a six-week course. Uh, and... Uh, and, and people at CBC weren't aware that we had a military leave policy. You know, it was like page 285 of the collective agreement. Um, but, but I don't think anybody had ever asked, you know, to, uh, uh, to reference it since World War II or something. I don't know. But, I mean, they gave me the time. They were very good about giving me the time, and, and that was fantastic. But, uh, and, and I think, and in, in Julie's point about just communicating, you know, uh, the sort of reintegration of reservists coming back from overseas, uh, you know, different, it really depends on where they've been and what they've seen and done. You know, and a, a one friend mentioned that he was literally in Afghanistan getting shot in a combat outpost or getting shot at in a combat outpost. And then, you know, two weeks later was sitting in a cubicle in an office tower at a bank in Calgary, you know, mm -hmm. and just kind of looking around doing, doing that. Like it was just so, even in spite of the army's efforts to, you know, have people do decompression in Cyprus between Afghanistan and coming home to Canada, it's still, there's still going to be that aspect of just readjustment and surrealism uh, when you go from one uh, high stress environment to something that's totally different. So I guess there needs to be that communication and just a little bit of understanding is always very helpful in terms of um, trying to see or understand what, you know, what a reservist might have been through depending on where they went and, and what they did. Great, thank you. So if you had to say, what is that number one thing that an employer can do to support reservists? What's that one thing that you would advise? Maybe totally unfair question, but. <laughs> you know what, I think if there's some flexibility in terms of their employment, that if you're willing to uh, consider that, look, if I let this person go away on a, a two week course or a four week course, um, it's going to help them with their military career. It's, it's going to hopefully, I think, uh, you know, make them a better employee in terms of their, their loyalty to their employer. And they're also going to bring back, uh, you know, new talents and new skills like, like Julie touched on in her presentation. So there is a win-win there, but, you know, it does require some, some flexibility in terms of uh, scheduling someone's employment. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little bit of a different direction here. Uh, Colonel Vernon, can you tell us a bit more about Force 2025? 
Will the strengths of reserve units increase and will the units receive the same types of equipment as their regular force counterparts in order to enable the best possible training? Yeah, so it's very, uh, it's still very early days. So, so Force 2025 is like a near term uh, attempt that was started under uh, uh, Lieutenant General Air when he was the Army commander. Now he's the acting chief of defense staff. Um, but a near term uh, attempt to sort of rebalance things, you know, looking at so what, are, you know, what are some 21st century skills uh, and, and, uh, capabilities that the military needs for example uh cyber warfare you know how do we how do we enhance ourselves in one area and and where where do those positions come from in another area so this rebalancing uh is going on across the army so regular force and reserve and and we're looking at what that you know what does that mean for the regular force uh in terms of integrating with the reservists you know like refining refining what they want us to do and so tell us what you want us to do uh, in very simple terms and give us the resources that we need to do that. So if you, you know, if you, um, I'll give you an example. So there's talk of bringing all the Army's tanks to the West and into Alberta. So all the Leopard 2s would all be resident in Alberta. And this would sort of become the uh, center of excellence for, uh, you know, kind of uh, armored, armored training. So what can we do as reservists? So if you want us to integrate with the regular force, then we're gonna need opportunities to make, uh, make some reservists tank drivers or tank gunners or tank crew commanders. You know, We can't augment you if we don't train on the same platforms. So that's uh, a major part of the discussion. What do you want us to do? And now, and now you need to give us you know, those specific weapon systems or vehicles so that we uh, can make a more seamless transition between being part-time reservists to being, you know, full-time augmentees. Uh, another example would be artillery. You know, the regular force fires one kind of pouncer, the Army Reserve fires another. So you need to do conversion training to go from being a reservist on a 105 millimeter howitzer to firing the M777 155 howitzer with the regular force. We don't have any 155s in the reserves. So those, those sorts of things need to be worked out. Um, it's too soon to say if we will be augmenting or diminishing the reserve in, in any way. Uh, there's no, you know, and that was uh, among the uh, Army commander's planning guidance. You know, he was very uh, uh, explicit and said, you know, units will not disappear as part of this, uh, as part of this rebalancing. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Colonel Vernon. Uh you touched on something a little earlier, which is uh, misconduct that we hear a lot about in the news uh, these days. And, and the question is around inappropriate conduct um, in the Canadian forces is, you know, it's obviously a hot topic. So this one is uh, for Major Helferty, you know, as a woman in this environment, do you believe the reserves are taking appropriate actions to change the culture? Well, talk about a tough question. <laughs> um, I guess I, I will say this, that um, it has never been my experience with the military personally that inappropriate conduct is something to be encouraged or allowed or um, supported in any way. Um, but that is not the experience of a lot of people, uh, which is obviously coming out in, in the media right now. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, this has been tough um, because to me, this uniform represents an ideal and a, a level of ethic that is, uh, it means so much more and it has never stood for anything that, uh, for all these things that, that are now coming out. Um, and as a result, I, I feel um, honestly quite devastated uh, that this has, um, th this has actually occurred uh, in the Canadian Forces. But that being said, I believe in the organization uh, to do the right thing uh, because I know what it fundamentally stands for and it doesn't stand for that. And we don't stand for that. Um, and so I think that in terms of the steps being taken, uh, I think this is still unfolding and we're still waiting to see, uh, you know, what's, what exactly is, uh, is going to happen. 
Um, but I will say that I wouldn't be wearing this uniform today and I wouldn't be here today if I didn't trust uh, the organization to do the right thing moving forward. Thank you, Major Halfordy. Can I just add to that? I mean, the Army, well, the Army that I joined full time in the 1980s was, especially the infantry, right, is predominantly white, uh, heterosexual, homophobic, misogynistic. There were a lot of good things about the military that I joined in the 80s. There are a lot of things that thankfully have changed, and there, there are a lot of things that still need to change. And um, we this summer, uh, so right now, are develop, we've, we've uh, created within our brigade, for example, a professional conduct and culture committee that is uh, male, female, all ranks, uh, looking to draft a plan going forward so that we'll have it for September, that we can put it out to units like Julie's and to expand the membership within this committee so that it's a, across our brigade with links to you know, the Army Reserve Brigades and the regular force brigade here in the West. Um, you know, what I'm hearing from the grassroots is that, first of all, we really need to listen to people's stories. And I, I was part of a, uh, a call like this when Lieutenant Colonel Eleanor Taylor spoke to the Army senior leadership back at the end of April after she had resigned um, due to, you know, in response to the revelations about some of the Army's leadership or the Canadian Forces leadership. Um, and it was extremely powerful for a lot of the men in the room who just, you know, we heard a number of stories that, that were read out, anonymous stories about uh, women's and some men's experiences. And, and when you just heard, you know, some of the things that Julia said that she's uh, avoided in her career or hasn't been exposed to, uh, but it was stunning to hear what, what some people have endured. And so one of the first things we're doing is we're going to be gathering stories like those anonymously from members of our brigade so that we can make them part of our training to, to hit home on an emotional level with uh, our members, uh, male members in particular, to give them a sense of, you know, what's been going on out there um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have, we're, you know, we're getting more statistics to bolster that. Um, education is so important, I think, and, and having, uh, you know, town halls, small discussions, and, and frankly, leadership, you know, from everybody in charge. You know, we need to own this. We need to, uh, we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Colonel Vernon. Uh, we have uh, another one here. Um, there's a number of times that reservists don't let their employers know that they are a reservist. And in CFLC, we, we come across this quite often because they think it might affect their employment. As reservists yourselves, what would you say to them, to the employers? Um, well, I mean, I, you know what? I, I think the benefits outweigh um, that, that need for, for flexibility, I think, for, for both parties. Uh, but there are a certain number of people I certainly am aware of, you know, who, for example, wanted to go to, you know, Afghanistan in, in a bad way or, or somewhere else. And um, occasionally, you know, don't make use of supports like CFLC or perhaps don't aren't aware of what some of the legislation is and, and have had and have occasionally taken sort of, you know, uh, drastic action in terms of like quitting their employment, you know, or, or they go overseas, they have such a great time and, and, you know, in onesies and twosies, they decide that they're going to component transfer to the regular force, which has an impact on their employer. So, it, it, you know, uh, there does need to be this flexibility and, and ideally, and sometimes that relationship is, uh, can be further strained um, when, when our soldiers do something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did you wanna to add to that, Julie? Well, in my case, I've, I mean, I've had the support from the beginning and actually it was something that I, uh, like it was on my resume because I joined the police in 2010 and I joined the Army Reserves in 2008. So, I mean, to me, this was something to, to bring forth as a positive to my employer and they saw it that way. Um, so it's not something that I've uh, had to deal with um, personally. Mm -hmm. And I think with uh, Canadian Forces Liaison Council, part of that is that is our mission and that is our mandate to help employers understand 
you know, the benefits of reservists, what they bring to the organization. And for employers, um, we also provide opportunities to help them understand what reservists do. You know, in COVID, it's unfortunate uh, that we're in a little bit of a stand down, but we have things like Executrex where we take employers to Wainwright or Esquimo to see firsthand the training that reservists have. And so whether you employ a reservist or don't employ a reservist, that's kind of not the point, but what is the point is, is that education and that understanding of that skill set that you spoke about so eloquently, Julie, of what you bring to your employer and what, the, what those benefits are. So there is that spot of uh, education and just understanding so that then the reservists can feel more confident being able to say and self-declare, yes, I am a reservist and I want to be able to uh, go on deployment or whether it's domestic or overseas, the irony is that reservists, many of them helped save many businesses in Calgary. And so that's the irony is that reservists were trying to save some of the very companies that they work for when that happened. And, uh, and we're all very fortunate and grateful for, for that service. So probably uh, we're coming up to time. I just wanted to have a few closing remarks and thank everyone for attending today, especially our speakers, Colonel Vernon and Major Halperty. And a reminder to find out more information about With Glowing Hearts, uh, and that can help also with education for employers and understanding what they do. And that is at cflcwithglowinghearts.ca. So on behalf of our Canadian Forces Liaison Council here in Alberta, thank you very much for attending and have a truly wonderful day. Thank you.